Hey everyone, thanks for coming back to Test 2 Plus again today. I am Trace, this is episode two of five in our series on volcanoes. Turns out there's a lot to learn about these giant mountains of magma and lava, which if you watched yesterday's episode, you would have learned what the difference is between the two of those. So go back and watch that if you haven't. Also make sure you subscribe to us right here on YouTube so you get all of the episodes this week. Today, let's talk about predicting volcanic eruptions, right? So volcanologists, which have probably one of my favorite names in all of science, study volcanoes and they try and help us be prepared. So when volcanoes do erupt, and they do all the time, they can pose less of a danger to human society. The thing is, we really need to predict those eruptions in order to give people warnings so that they can actually do something about it. But we need to understand volcanic eruptions a little more thoroughly before we can predict those eruptions. So what causes a volcanic eruption? All of that magma beneath the Earth's crust is sort of like a ticking time bomb. And there are two types of volcanic eruptions, effusive and explosive. Effusive is when magma reaches the surface and it kind of like oozes out, like flows out like lava, it's kind of boring. Explosive eruptions are when the magma becomes unstable as it rises to the surface and then it explodes out of the vent. And this happens for a bunch of different factors, and those are obviously the ones that are a little more dangerous to us. In an explosive eruption, we get ash and what's called degassing, you know, when the volcano releases all this gas. In effusive or oozy eruptions, we don't really get that ash as much. It just kind of has lava come out. What causes each of these eruptions is actually pretty interesting. So several things determine whether or not a volcano is gonna erupt in general, but there are three main contributors. The buoyancy of the magma, the pressure from the gases released by that magma, and the introduction of new magma in with old magma. These are three different ways that a volcano can erupt or decide to erupt if you want to personify it. A buoyancy eruption model is the effusive model. It's more oozy. As we learned earlier, when rock inside of the earth melts, you get magma. It's you know, like a liquefied rock. It's melted. That magma has the same mass as the rock that it melted from, but the volume of the rock has actually increased. It's actually less dense, which makes it more buoyant. So it's weird to think of rocks like, like buoyancy and floating and liquids, but all solids can you know, become liquids. And when that happens, they change state and thus they change some of their physical properties. So the rocks do end up floating on a less dense rock, it rises. If the density of that magma continues to decrease, it's gonna rise all the way to the top of the surface and find a vent to try and get out. And if that happens, boom, you get an eruption. I mean, maybe not boom, more like because it's you know oozing, it's not exploding, but either way. The second eruption model is explosive, and this is the pressure of gases that are released by the magma. So magma sometimes will contain a lot of water, sulfur dioxide or carbon dioxide or other gases, and if that happens, it can cause more violent eruptions. As it moves toward the surface, similar to the previous model, the solubility of water in the magma decreases. Now let me explain what that means. Think of it like bubbles in a can of soda, right? When the magma is under a lot of pressure, the water is dissolved into the magma itself. But as that pressure drops, the water can come out of that solution and then that excess water bubbles up and you get that glub, 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 glub of magma that you see in videos. And uh, as more and more water comes out of the magma, the gas to magma ratio begins to increase. Because remember, this is still really hot. So if water comes out of the magma, it doesn't come out like as water, it comes out as water vapor, it comes out as a gas. And once the gas to magma ratio hits a certain point, then the whole thing just becomes this system of explosion. And it shoots what's known as a pyroclastic cloud or pyroclastic material into the air. And it's super violent. And it's, you know, the volcanic eruption that we all know and love from television and movies. Maybe not love in real life, but, you know, in movies. The third eruption model is when new magma flows into a chamber that already contains magma. So magma is kind of a loner, doesn't mix well with other magmas. So the new magma could have a different makeup. And, and once it's introduced, something in the old magma could react with something in the new magma, essentially. Once introduced, old magma is gonna have to move upward and outward to get out of the way of this newer 
magma. It's not necessarily going to be an effusive eruption or an explosive eruption. It's hard to tell. It would depend on all of these different situations. But either way, they don't mix well. And often when a new magma is introduced into the system, it causes problems. There are, of course, other factors as well. Crystals in the magma can make it more viscous which makes it more likely to explode. Magma and lava temperatures can change, and that will affect how the explosion or eruption happens. High temperature lava erupts effusively, more oozy-like. Low temperature lava doesn't flow very easily, so it gets clogged and it's more likely to explode. There's actually a scale of sorts which characterizes the viciousness of eruptions. Basically, they use the explosivity and the height of the eruption to find where it falls on the scale. And it, that's kind of hard to do because volcanoes are going to erupt differently throughout their eruption. Eruptions aren't just one thing. They happen over time. But here we go. So first is a Hawaiian eruption. It's usually a low viscosity eruption. It shoots lava up in the air about a kilometer high. It's known as fire fountaining. You see it in all the videos. It's awesome. Super cool. Hawaiian. Next is Strombolian. These eruptions uh, shoot lunch meat. I'm just kidding. They don't shoot lunch meat. They shoot short bursts of glowing lava into the air and the viciousness of the eruption. It's a little more extreme than Hawaiian, but it's one of the least violent explosive eruptions. There's Vulcanian, and they're very short, very staccato-like eruption. They're very violent. They shoot out pyroclastic material at like 800 or more miles an hour and several miles high. And in case you didn't notice, uh, these are getting more and more violent as we go on, uh, just kind of in general, you know, kind of like pizza, Hawaiian's the worst, so. Then there's the Plinian eruption, which is the largest and most violent volcanic eruption on Earth. These would shoot incredible amounts of gas, up to 35 miles into the air. The ash can travel hundreds or thousands of miles, affecting the whole planet, potentially. These babies can just do so much damage, and they're super dangerous. Mount St. Helens. In the, uh, in the 80s, this was an example of a Plinian eruption. It killed 57 people. More than 200 homes were destroyed. You know, infrastructure and roads and bridges destroyed, just devastated. There's also uh, a number of other eruption types, the Lava Dome and Surtsean eruptions. But uh, let's kind of keep moving here. St. Helens was huge and destructive. It maybe would have been nice if we'd have seen that coming, right? And we used to think that it wasn't really all that feasible to predict volcanic eruptions because you'd have to understand how the magma is moving deep in the Earth's crust and where it's going to come out is going to be tough and how it's going to come out and whether it's going to be effusive or if it's going to, you know, how the viscosity is. There's just so much to know. So beyond obvious warning signs like small earthquakes and temperatures rising in a region or under a mountain or gas expulsion in a region and higher sulfur content of that expelled gas, might mean that the volcano is closer to erupting. But these really only work for large eruptions, things that are building like a, like a kettle of boiling water. So it works for Mount St. Helens, and it would work for Mount Etna in Italy. But it doesn't work for every eruption. So volcanologists have been working to try and figure out how to predict these volcanic events. And they have to have some understanding of not just what's going on underneath the ground, but also the history of that region, right? They have to have instruments that are reading that volcano in advance. They have to have seismometers and mechanical sniffers to sense any volatile chemical changes in the air, even things that would be imperceptible to us. And they'd have to be monitoring and interpreting that data constantly and for a long time in order to understand geologic changes in the region. This is really hard stuff, and it takes a lot of prep a team of researchers from the Department of Earth Sciences at Royal Holloway University of London just started to learn to predict volcanoes in 2015. And now we're in 2016, and we're just getting there. But imagine if you were an ancient civilization, and you wanted to categorize all of these different things. You wanted to understand what's going on with all of these different types of volcanoes and the different types of eruptions and what they mean. What if you witnessed a Plinian eruption as like a Stone Age society? What would you think when you looked at that? We're going to talk about that tomorrow on Test Tube Plus and how that relates back to the science of volcanology. It's going to be really, really cool. Make sure you check it out by coming back tomorrow. Make sure you subscribe. Let us know down in the comments which one of the volcanoes is your favorite type of eruption. Do you like the oozy ones or the explosive -y ones? Let us know why. Also, come find us on Twitter. You can find the show at Test Tube. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. Thanks for tuning in.